like to take the opportunity to welcome Rick Turley to the podium, who will introduce our speaker, Dr. Patrick Mason. Rick, the, the chair is yours. Thank you, Greg. Patrick Mason holds the Leonard J. Arrington Chair of Mormon History and Culture at Utah State University, where he is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies and History and Director of the Religious Studies Program. He earned a BA in History from Brigham Young University and an MA in International Peace Studies and a PhD in History from the University of Notre Dame. Before joining the faculty at USU in 2019, Dr. Mason previously taught at Notre Dame, the American University in Cairo, Egypt, Claremont Graduate University in California, and at the University of the West in Romania, where he was a Fulbright Scholar. He is a past president of the Mormon History Association and has served on the boards of MHA and the Dialogue Foundation. He is the author or editor of several books, including The Mormon Menace, Violence and Anti-Mormonism in the Postbellum South, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2011, Mormonism and Violence, The Battles of Zion, published by Cambridge University Press in 2019, and most recently with David Pulsifer, Proclaim Peace, The Restoration's Answer to an Age of Conflict. Along with two other colleagues, Dr. Mason recently helped launch a certificate program in global peace building at Utah State University. I just want to say on a more personal level, I've known Patrick for many years, and I've watched him go from a graduate student to occupant of one of the most prestigious chairs in history in the Western United States. And it's a chair that bears the name of Leonard J. Arrington, a name that's familiar to most of us. Dr. Arrington was well known for his books and articles, but I think his legacy can be felt even long after his death through the people that he influenced as a mentor and as a, a teacher, as well as a collaborator and someone who assisted others in their research. As the occupant of the Leonard J. Arrington Chair, Patrick is carrying on that tradition, helping to raise a new generation of students whose impact will not be fully felt for, gener for decades to come. So with that, I introduce uh, Dr. Patrick Mason. Thank you, Rick. I really appreciate that. And uh, it's great to be with you all tonight. Um, I was feeling a little bit bad that uh, I wasn't going to get a free dinner out of the deal, but then I heard the financial report, so I'm glad I didn't burden the uh, the association uh, with with my free victuals. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm I'm really glad to be with you all tonight, uh, especially among so many friends and colleagues and mentors, uh, people who have helped me along the way, uh, including Rick, who who just introduced me. So it's uh, great to be here. And uh, the topic that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, uh, Latter-day Saint violence in Pioneer, Utah, uh, is a topic that actually, you know, several of the, the people uh, on, on this call have published important works uh, about. And so uh, uh, any insights that I have are certainly built on, on the foundation of others. So as many of you know, Sherlock Holmes helped introduce the world to Mormon violence. Arthur Conan Doyle's first Sherlock Holmes novel was A Study in Scarlet, published in 1887, the same year as the Edmund Tucker Act uh, really clamped down on polygamy and theocracy in Utah. And this first Sherlock Holmes murder mystery featured Sherlock Holmes first in Victorian England, but then the story transports across the ocean to the country of the saints in the mountain deserts of Utah. And here, the citizens of the territory live in perpetual fear under the theocratic grip of a cold, stern Brigham Young. In Doyle's rendering, Young is all too eager to dispatch his secret police, the dreaded Danites, in maintaining his reign of terror. The man who held out against the church vanished away, wrote Doyle, and a rash word or a hasty act was followed by annihilation. Residents live in fear and trembling, daring not speak a word out of line for fear that their neighbor or even a member of their own family might be one of Young's enforcers and bring down a swift retribution upon them. Of course, Doyle wasn't the only one who used Latter-day Saint violence as a useful plot device. Uh, 
19th and 20th century novelists on both sides of the Atlantic frequently outdid one another, referring to the destroying angels of Mormonism. Authors like Zane Gray and Lewis, Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, there, were, there was a rash of films, especially in the early 20th century, with titles like A Victim of the Mormons, Marriage or Death, The Danites, and Trapped by the Mormons, all of which screened to, to audiences across the United States and Europe. And this trope of the violent Mormon still pops up occasionally. Uh, for instance, in John Krakauer's book, Under the Banner of Heaven, published in 2003, which by all indications is probably the best-selling book on Mormonism in this century, uh, as well as uh, big budget Hollywood flops like September Dawn. So this, uh, this sinister image uh, of the violent Mormon uh, continues to recur in the public mind, perhaps not quite as as uh, as prominently now as it did in the late 19th and 20th century, uh, but it still is part of an image of a religion whose success is owed in part to coercive tactics of repression against both internal and external enemies. So, of course, most of the depictions of Mormonism that, that we see uh, irresistibly focus on polygamy. Uh, and I'm not going to talk very much about that tonight. In fact, most of the, the episodes of violence that we'll talk about don't have an immediately clear connection to polygamy. Uh, but the other part that, that did occupy the minds of lots of people like Arthur Conan Doyle and lots of these filmmakers was the violence that was associated with Latter-day Saints, especially in their 19th century history. Now, the most lethal decade in Latter-day Saint history was the 1850s. Uh, and so a lot of what I'll talk about tonight uh, deals with that fateful decade. Um, and in fact, as we think about Latter-day Saint violence, we can really think about three different categories, or we can, we can divide it into three different categories in which they use violence as a force uh, against perceived enemies, including dissenters from the faith, uh, non-Mormons or Gentiles in 19th century parlance whom they considered to be dangerous or hostile, and of course, Native Americans who lived on the land or competed for resources that the Mormon pioneers sought as they were settling the Great Basin. Now, as I, I start, it's important to, to include a, a note of caution. Um, anytime, if, if, if we were to characterize in any kind of monolithic way, uh, 19th century Mormon society as inherently and uniquely violent, I think that would be a misrepresentation. Uh, many of the contemporaneous claims of Latter-day Saint violence were clearly exaggerations or fabrications. Uh, for instance, in 1875, uh, a newspaper in Utah reported that a man named Samuel Sarine had been killed by the Danites. Uh, in fact, he had just simply moved to California. So we see instances like this occasionally where, where these, journalists, uh, these journalistic accounts couldn't help themselves, but, but clearly uh, the record was exaggerated. Most Utahns, Latter-day Saints and otherwise, lived in peace one another. And in fact, uh, Utah uh, had a kind of structural and spiritual and legalistic framework that provided uh, a, a fairly orderly frontier society, especially compared to, to some of the neighboring territories and states. And it's actually fairly remarkable that, that due to the, the research of lots of historians laboring over the past several decades, uh, we feel reasonably confident that, that we can name almost every instance of violence, at least lethal violence, by members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints against their enemies, real or perceived, uh, during these decades. And, uh, and so this is, this is especially remarkable at a, in a time period in which violence was rife uh, throughout the United States, especially on the frontier and in the South. Uh, for instance, those who study uh, violence against Native Americans or against African Americans in the South uh, uh, admit freely uh, that there's no way that, that they can possibly document all the cases uh, of, of violence against those groups. So the very fact that, that we can name and number uh, the instances of violence committed by Latter-day Saints uh, in Pioneer Utah uh, to, to some degree suggests uh, its, li its limited character. But nevertheless, the chronicle of Latter-day Saint violence during this period does not have to be embellished in order be, to be tragic. Uh, 
Mormon pioneers participated in the forced displacement and massacres of native peoples in the American West. Latter-day Saint settlers perpetrated the single largest civilian massacre in American history in 1857. And many of those who fell away from the faith and territorial Utah experienced threats, intimidation, or worse. In short, Latter-day Saints in Pioneer Utah did engage in violence. And the justifications for that violence were rooted in part in their particular religious cosmology and experience. But most Mormon violence, I would contend, can also be understood as being symptomatic of broader trends of frontier violence in 19th century America. Latter-day Saints were never just Mormons. They were also American frontiersmen and settler colonists who participated in the types of violence that were common to those groups. So, uh, so we're going to focus tonight mostly on the first decade of Latter-day Saint settlement in Utah uh, from the late 1840s through the late 1850s. This was a singularly violent period in Mormon history, and I think that'll help uh, bring some of the, the, the dynamics and trends uh, into, into sharper relief. So first, let me talk about violence against the indigenous peoples of this region. Of course, the Great Basin uh, may have seemed desolate to the Euro-American settlers who came here in the late 1840s with the, the Mormon pioneers, but this was not an empty land. As with other Euro-American settlers, one of the first issues that the Latter-day Saints faced as they colonized their new home was to establish relations with the native peoples that had inhabited this land for generations. Now, if the saints had been sensitized through their own experience of being persecuted and violently driven from their homes as a result of cultural differences, unfortunately, they did not seem to apply those lessons to the people whose traditional lands they now came to occupy. Now, I won't get into the whole history of Latter-day Saints and Native Americans. Lots of other people have, have done that history. But I think it's uh, Jared Farmer, uh, uh, does a nice job of capturing what he calls the tension in Mormon thought between Indian as brother and Indian as other, between sympathy and contempt, belief and doubt. Pioneer leaders, Farmer says, sincerely meant to try to redeem the Lamanites, but first things came first and violence ensued. So the first wave of Mormon pioneers in 1847 coexisted warily with the Ute and Shoshone inhabitants of the Salt Lake Valley. But the sudden swell in population led to increased stress on the region's available fresh water, timber, game, and fish. Conflict between pioneers and the natives gradually escalated over the next two years, especially as Latter-day Saint settlements began to expand into Utah Valley to the south. Or initially, Brigham Young seemed to count, counseled his people to keep their distance from Indians and to deal with them fairly. And he seemed to believe that the relationship between the two groups could be managed, basically on his terms, with Indian allies, ultimately under Latter-day Saint control and converting, ideally, to their religion. There were limited outbreaks of low-level violence in 1848 and 1849, but things took a significant turn for the worse in 1850 when three Latter-day Saint settlers savagely murdered a Ute named Old Bishop for stealing a shirt. At a council convened to determine next steps, church leaders adopted an us or them mentality. As Young pronounced, they must either quit the ground or we must. If we don't kill those Lake Utes, they will kill us. Now keep in mind that this was just over a decade removed from Governor Boggs' extermination order in Missouri. And so upon the unanimous recommendation of this council, Brigham Young ordered a selective campaign, a, a, a campaign that could only be described as selective extermination with youth men to be killed and women and children to be saved when possible. The resultant military operation resulted in the deaths of approximately 100 youths and one Latter-day Saint. This was disproportionate. And this war also brought atrocities. Yesterday was Valentine's Day. At Table Rock on Valentine's Day in 1850, Latter-day Saint militiamen lined up a group of 11 Utes who had surrendered and summarily executed them as their families looked on in horror. The settlers decapitated the Indians' bodies and sent their heads to Salt Lake City 
for science. The church's first presidency temporarily advocated a policy of removing all Indians from Utah territory, a grim echo of the Trail of Tears, not to mention their own forced exoduses from Missouri and Illinois. Of course, indigenous peoples were never entirely removed from Utah, but over the next two decades, Latter-day Saints assisted federal agents in systematically subjugating and dispossessing the native Ute, Shoshone, Goshute, Pavant, Sandpit, and Southern Paiute populations. Those who survived were forced onto remote reservations. Now, it's important to recognize that the Brigham Young did not have the appetite for sustained Indian killing. In the early 1850s, Brigham Young was not only prophet president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but also territorial governor and superintendent of Indian affairs. And this is when he developed his policy that it's cheaper to feed the Indians than to fight them, a position that I believe was driven as much by pragmatism as by principle. Uh, and we do see a number of benevolent and positive interactions between the Latter-day Saints uh, and the local tribes. Uh, outbreaks of violence did continue to sporadically pop up, most notably during the Black Hawk War of 1865 to 1868, which also included the Circleville Massacre, in which at least 16 captured Paiutes were murdered, uh, including women and children. So after the Black Hawk War, relations between the Saints and the Paiutes on Utah's southern frontier settled into a more comfortable and largely nonviolent pattern with frequent intermingling, even occasional intermarriage, but the regional power dynamic had been well established. So in short, and of course, there's a lot more history here that, I, that I'm not covering uh, in this brief presentation, but in a lot of ways, as we look at this Latter-day Saint violence against Native Americans in Pioneer Utah, it's, it's easy to explain in its historical context, although it's still quite hard to stomach. Quite simply, the saints acted like other white American settler colonists, first on their own accord, then as willing agents of the US government. The recognizable pattern of white colonial violence is all the more tragic in Utah, however, given the saints' distinctive eschatological beliefs about the important roles to be played by the Lamanites, who they believe the Native Americans to be, in the last days. But while the content of Latter-day Saint Lamanite theology differed from the romanticized Euro-American portrait of the Indian as a noble savage, the two mythologies functioned similarly by placing native peoples on an unattainable pedestal. Realities of frontier settlement among the Lamanites proved disillusioning for the saints, as lived experience didn't accord with the prophecies of the Book of Mormon. The Indians' resultant fall from grace in the Latter-day Saint settlers' eyes touched off a period of intermittent and sometimes intense violence between the two groups that lasted until Utah's native peoples were effectively removed from areas of white settlement. Latter-day Saint violence against Utah's original inhabitants was largely typical of the disastrous history of white Indian relations on the American frontier with cultural differences and competition over land and natural resources precipitating conflict, war, and occasional atrocities. Though sung in a Mormon key, the tune of white settler violence was depressingly familiar. So second, I wanna talk about violence against non-Latter-day Saints, known at the time as Gentiles. So imagining non-Mormons as Gentiles, as a group uh, that in terms of the kind of biblical worldview that Latter-day Saints brought with them, uh, that were somewhat outside of God's favor, or at least not fully part of the promises given to the children of Israel. This had helped in part justify uh, Danite violence against Missourians in 1838. And Latter-day Saint antipathy towards the Gentiles, especially those whom they perceived to be their, their antagonists and enemies, increased exponentially, especially in the period immediately following the murder of Joseph Smith. The surviving members of the Council of 50, which Smith organized shortly before his death, were especially vitriolic in their denunciations. At a series of meetings held less than a year after the prophet's murder in 1844, Brigham Young declared that the Gentiles' doom is sealed. Because the Gentiles had spilt the blood of our prophets and sought to kill us off, W.W. Phelps said, he retained no feeling of mercy for them. In turn, Young endorsed the sentiments of others on the council who said, 
let the damned scoundrels be killed, let them be swept off from the face of the earth. Now, part of this we can understand as uh, deep trauma in the wake of the murder of Joseph Smith, uh, who, who they had deeply loved and had been their prophet for the past 14 years. And in a lot of ways, these statements that we hear from the Council of 50 uh, had more bark than bite. But Latter-day Saints had internalized the violence they had received over the past decade and found other ways to project it. And they took that with them as they went to the West and settled in Utah. Now, of course, in the immediate wake of Joseph Smith's death, that when they chose to leave Nauvoo, not entirely of their own uh, free will, of course, but Brigham Young did choose to sign a treaty uh, with the people around them uh, rather than to fight it out. And so despite all of the harsh words, uh, the, the saints were more inclined both for self-preservation and not to spill other people's blood than to engage in outright uh, bloodshed in Nauvoo. But nevertheless, they took these hard feelings with them as they traveled here to Utah. And as President James Buchanan sent the U.S. Army uh, in what uh, became known as the Utah War, the Saints received word of the advancing army on the day that they were celebrating the 10th anniversary of their arrival into the Salt Lake Valley, July 24th. They immediately adopted a defiant tone. A hastily composed song expressed the expectation and even invitation of violence to come. Powder, bullet, sword, and gun, boys aroused will have some fun. As sure as fate, the time has come, so fix your guns for shooting. Goaded by Brigham Young, church members saw the marching troops as yet another mob. Apostle Franklin D. Richards appealed to God for protection against the hostilities of any mob that shall invade our territory. Hans Mill massacre survivor Charles Jameson ascended the pulpit during a Sunday meeting a week later uh, after learning of the army's approach and proclaimed, I feel like fighting. And if any mob comes here, I feel like giving them the best I've got in the locker. So a clear consensus emerged. The saints would not let history repeat itself. They would take whatever strong measures were necessary to protect their community from this latest threat. With the army on the march, but still well out of reach, a number of Latter-day Saints lashed out at various Gentile proxies in their midst. In late July, 1857, a group of saints attacked the U.S. Surveyor's Office in Salt Lake City. They assailed the surveyor with a barrage of rocks and gave excommunicated church member employed there as a clerk a tremendous thrashing with stones and clubs. Two days later, Latter-day Saint vigilantes hauled a second clerk out of the office and carried, carried him to the nearby Jordan River, where they placed a rope around his neck and forced him at gun and knife point to testify against his superiors. Now, of course, the absolute low point in all of this uh, came two months later in September 1857, the Mountain Meadows Massacre. I know that that horrific event is well known to all of you here, so I'm not going to spend the time uh, to, to detail it. Um, but just to keep in mind uh, that it was part and parcel uh, of, of this dynamic, uh, but, but scaled just um, uh, horrifically beyond anything the, the, uh, that we see in any of these other instances. Um, because the Utah War was mediated peacefully without major pitched battles between the U.S. Army and the Latter-day Saints, uh, sometimes the conflict has been characterized as being bloodless. Uh, but this is where I, I appreciate the insight of historian William McKinnon, who's demonstrated uh, that events surrounding the Utah War, including the Mountain Meadows Massacre, resulted in approximately 150 fatalities, about the same number as in Bleeding Kansas. Uh, so again, the majority of those fatalities came at Mountain Meadows, but in fact, the Utah War was, was not bloodless. Uh, so how do we explain all of this Latter-day Saint violence against Gentiles. Now, a lot of people have spent a lot of time, uh, Rick Turley chief among them, thinking about how do we explain the Mountain Meadows massacre? How do we explain this broader dynamic of violence against non-Mormons in the 1850s? I think part of it, we can look to a general culture of violence on the American frontier, and of course, the war hysteria particular to 1857. I think there's also something to the observation that many scholars have made 
that violence inheres or at least potentiates in the act of oppositional identity formation, the notion of saints versus Gentiles. But we should also seriously consider the saints' own self-understanding that what they were experiencing, experiencing in 1857 was a recapitulation of what they had endured in Missouri and Illinois. Violence has a long lasting psychological effect on groups as well as on individuals, especially when they've been victimized precisely because of their group identity. Social psychologist Irvin Staub describes some of the effects of post-traumatic stress on groups. Having been victimized in the past, members of a group may harbor feelings of anxiety, hostility, and anger toward other people. These sentiments can in turn justify the desire to do harm to others before they're able to do harm to you, a kind of inverted golden rule. Unhealed psychological wounds, Staub argues, can under certain conditions lead some former victims to become perpetrators. Perceiving a threat, people may engage in what they believe is self-defense, but their defense of violence may be unnecessary or more forceful than necessary. As Staub uh, demonstrates, some people repress or are able to reconcile past victimization, but others, however, for them, deep injuries in the past often become a strong part of the individual's and group's identity. The group can define itself, see itself in the world, and interpret new events from the perspective of that past history and its Victimization and trauma can become central to the group's history, identity, and orientation to the world. So in perceiving the marching army as a mob, Latter-day Saint settlers were not suffering from irrational paranoia. They had been the victims of very real atrocities in the years prior to emigrating west. And rather than providing redress to their grievances, now the government was marshalling its armed forces to subdue them. But the saints weren't just victims in this drama. They were also historical agents who had displaced their traumas and festering antipathies onto parties who had not done them harm and who did not represent an existential threat. The massacre at Mountain Meadows is the most appalling example of this. But it also helps explain the other episodes of Mormon violence in that tragic year of 1857. Unintentionally and unwittingly, President Buchanan's decision to send the US Army against the saints stoked in them the embers of their past trauma and helped ignite a conflagration that engulfed scores of Gentile innocents who under other circumstances may well have received humane treatment, probably would have received humane treatment from the saints. Their own historical experiences as victims of violence provided a powerful script for Latter-day Saints in perpetrating violence against others. Finally, I wanna talk about violence by Latter-day Saints against dissenters, uh, uh, or those within uh, the group that they considered to be dangerous. So we oftentimes talk about uh, anti-Mormon persecution and the threats uh, from, from the outside of the community. But the Latter-day Saints, uh, both in response to that, but also to, to uh, perceived and real internal threats, this began all the way back in Missouri, uh, continued in Illinois, and then into Pioneer, Utah. They prioritized maintaining commun community cohesion. The Saints often blamed their troubles on dissent originating from within the church. Of course, they knew there were enemies outside, but oftentimes they pointed the finger to people on the inside. Quelling that dissent, which they usually framed as apostasy, occupied much of the time and attention of the religion's leaders. Loyalty became a prime Latter-day Saint virtue. Upon taking leadership of the church, Brigham Young soon let it be known that malcontents were unwelcome in the community and should leave voluntarily or be subject to the Mormon's own brand of vigilantism. Young's invective against dissenters could be biting. In an 1853 sermon, he stormed, now you nasty apostates, clear out. After rehearsing a violent dream in which he saw himself cut the throats of two apostates from ear to ear, he declared to the congregation, I say rather than that apostates should flourish here, I will unsheath my bowie knife and conquer or die. But Young could also adopt a gentler approach 
1856, responding to reports that many disenchanted saints were planning to leave Utah Territory, Young offered them encouragement. I wish everyone to go who prefers doing so, and if they'll go like gentlemen, they go with my best feelings. Whether his tongue was covered in honey or vinegar, Young's emphasis on the, on the necessity of internal unity and the menace of those who threatened it remained constant throughout this period. Unlike his tirades against the federal government and the nation, which he actually had no power over, Young's harangues against so-called apostates did have real effects. For instance, in the church's April 1854 General Conference, he stood before the congregation and denounced Jesse Hartley as a vagrant, a thief, and a robber. Young thundered in front of the gathered faithful that Hartley ought to be baptized in Salt Lake with stones tied to him and hold him under 24 hours to wash away the 100th part of his sins. This verbal onslaught must have caught anyone who attended the whole conference by surprise, since just the day prior, Young had called Hartley on a mission to Texas, normally, of course, a sign of the church's favor. Now, however, the church president proclaimed from the pulpit that Hartley should be sent to hell to preach to the damned and moved that he be excommunicated on the spot. Now, Hartley had previously been accused and acquitted of horse thievery, which was often a capital offense in 19th century America. Young may also have known that Jesse Hartley had written a letter to Secretary of War Jefferson Davis recommending that the Latter-day Saint prophet be removed and replaced as territorial governor, an act that in the early Utah theocracy could be taken as both treasonous disloyalty and damnable apostasy. Still, the timing and the vehemence of Young's denunciation of Hartley remains perplexing. I, I frankly can't fully explain it. I'd be interested if somebody else can. Whatever else, or whatever sparked Young's outrage, Hartley clearly got the message that his presence had become odious to the community. Within the month, he started to make his way out of the territory, leaving behind his wife and newborn baby. In the mountains east of Salt Lake City, Hartley ran into a party of men that included Orson Hyde, the president of the church's Quorum of Twelve Apostles, Hosea Stout, a former Danite, Nauvoo Legion commander and chief of police in Nauvoo, and Bill Hickman, one of Brigham Young's more notorious enforcers. In his memoir, Hickman later wrote that Hyde had given him orders from Young that if they intercepted Hartley, they should, quote, have him used up. Hickman obliged and reported that Hyde affirmed that the job was well done. Now, Hickman's uh, memoir, of course, is notoriously unreliable. Available evidence makes it impossible to either prove or disprove his claim that Young ordered a hit on Hartley and used Hyde to deliver his message. If it was true, the irony would be tragically rich since Hyde had temporarily left the church or apostatized in 1838 when he objected to the vigilante methods employed by the Danites in Missouri. We simply don't know the whole story. Most of the violence against dissenters in early Utah came during a brief but intense period known as the Mormon Reformation, and I know you're all familiar with that. Even sympathetic observers admitted that the era was characterized by some fanaticism. Um, let me uh, skip forward here uh, just a little bit. One of the teachings, of course, during uh, the Reformation uh, by Brigham Young and other leaders of the church was that of blood atonement. Historical evidence indicating the blood atonement sermons resulted in actual violence is circumstantial at best and involves even then only a small handful of cases. In general, blood atonement preaching did not bear much fruit. Most church members shrugged off the proclaimed doctrine and it never became a core element of Latter-day Saint belief or practice. Either lay members understood their leader's violent talk to be mere bombast or their own moral sensibilities led them to reject blood atonement as an acceptable practice, regardless of what their leaders taught. What the emotionally and religiously charged climate of the Mormon Reformation did produce was a greater tolerance for the use of vigilante violence to enforce conformity and either intimidate or punish dissidents and deviants. Uh, 
In, February, in mid February 1857, unidentified assailants ambushed John Tobin and three traveling companions while they camped on the banks of the Santa Clara River in southern Utah, leaving three of the four men with non fatal gunshot wounds. Tobin was a recent convert to the church who was traveling to California to join the army. For much of his journey through central and southern Utah, Tobin had been traveling with two released convicts named John Ambrose and Thomas Betts, but the party had split up as often happened on the trail. In a February 6th letter to local church leaders in the region, Brigham Young instructed that the pair of felons, whom he never named, should be closely watched and perhaps even killed, depending on how you interpret it. Be on the lookout now and have a few trusty men ready in case of need to pursue, retake, and punish me. We do not suppose there would be any prosecutions for false imprisonments or talebearers for witnesses. It seems that Tobin and his traveling companions were either confused by their assailants for Ambrose and Betts, or it was believed that the convicts were still in camp with Tobin. In either case, Young's directions to his subordinates in the southern settlements seemed to have precipitated the attack on the Tobin party. The botched ambush on the Santa Clara, Santa Clara River fortunately led to no fatalities, but the incident did have ripple effects. Young's letters authorizing surveillance and perhaps punitive measures against Ambrose and Betts also contributed unintentionally to the murder of three men in Springville, nearly 300 miles to the north of where the Tobin party was attacked. Having lost his faith in the church, Springville resident William Parrish was preparing to leave Utah Territory. Springville Bishop Aaron Johnson got wind of Parrish's plans and apparently interpreted Young's cryptic instructions in his February 6th letter as a more general endorsement of decisive action against perceived enemies. After consulting with the church council, Johnson sent spies to monitor the apostate Parrish and lead him into a trap. One spy, Gardner, Gardner Potter, nicknamed Duff, convinced Parrish to walk with him at night to a prearranged location but the operation was bungled when the designated shooter mistook the two men and fatally shot Potter. Upon realizing his error, the assailant tackled Parrish and repeatedly stabbed him, then slit his throat. Separately, another spy accompanied Parrish's son, William Jr., to a predetermined spot where the younger Parrish was shot and killed. A second Parrish son, Oren, was apprehended, but released unharmed the next day. No one was ever convicted for the three deaths, and Bishop Johnson was never disciplined for his role in helping orchestrate the murder of three of his flock. There were other graphic instances of violence as, 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 as well. Uh, perhaps the most famous, uh, 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 if also cringeworthy, uh, comes with the Manti resident Thomas Lewis. He had been sentenced for five years imprisonment for attempted murder. While being escorted to the territorial prison in October of 1856, a party of men abducted Lewis, brutally castrated him, and left him for dead, bleeding in the snow. Brigham Young refused to condemn Bishop Warren Snow, who had authorized the castration and defended the action when Lewis's mother complained to him about it. The following year, a bishop in Payson led several members of his ward in fatally shooting a young Latter-day Saint man and, and his mother for incest. The vigilantes then killed the infant girl born of this incestuous relationship. Violent policing of sexual norms remained common in Utah for the next several decades, which paralleled similar actions taken across the nation in the name of protecting male honor, female virtue, and racial purity. Now, to be clear, most dissidents in 19th century Utah were never violently accosted, and most of those guilty of various perceived sexual transgressions received punishments far short of castration and murder. Vigilante violence was not the normal vehicle for the enforcement of social norms in Pioneer Utah, even during the heat of the Reformation. Yet the cases that did occur nevertheless revealed that at least some significant elements of the Latter-day Saint leadership and their deputies on both a general and local level had come to accept deadly violence as an effective, if selectively employed, instrument to enforce both their own authority and the people's conformity all in the name of building a godly society. In some respects, Latter-day Saint violence in Pioneer Utah aligned broadly with many, <coughs> excuse me. So in some respects, this violence aligned with broadly with many of the contemporaneous patterns of American vigilantism, 
Yet the saint's violence departed from the norms of 19th century frontier vigilantism on at least two accounts. First, some cases, for instance, the Hartley and the Parrish Potter murders, took the form of targeted assassinations committed by individual assailants. Summary executions by lone gunmen were not uncommon in the West, but they didn't fit the criteria of respectable frontier justice. Second, 19th century Americans accepted vigilantism insofar as they did because it met an otherwise unfulfilled need of providing law and order in settings where the foundations of a stable society were not fully established or functional. Pioneer Utah, however, was hardly a typical frontier community. Indeed, the very success of Mormon pioneering in the Great Basin was primarily a result <coughs> of the remarkable solidarity and orderliness provided by the church structure. The saints, <coughs> excuse me, the saints settlements possessed a functioning legal system from the outset, often mediated through the local bishop. The relative effectiveness of Latter-day Saint law enforcement helps explain why Utah was distinctive among states and territories in the American West, in that it was the home to almost no large-scale organized vigilantism. In other words, Latter-day Saint communities featured mechanisms of social order that could rival long-established cities and towns in the East, thus minimizing, if not eliminated, the stated purpose of extra-legal violence in maintaining social stability. Much of the violence against dissenters and deviants in Pioneer Utah is therefore better categorized as illegal rather than extra-legal. <clears throat> that perpetrators were rarely tried, let alone convicted of their crimes, demonstrates the failure of both the Mormon-controlled justice system in the territory and a clear system of checks and balances on the Latter-day Saint ecclesiastical elite. The resort to extrajudicial means of discipline and punishment undermined the rule of law and eroded moral authority. While in some cases it's true that the saints were acting just like their contemporaries and using violence against unwanted elements in their communities, in other instances they stretched the already elastic norms of the 19th century American frontier. So in conclusion, particularly during the first decade of the Latter-day Saints settlement in the Great Basin, they did employ violent means in asserting their religious and cultural dominance over the region. Traumatized by multiple bouts of persecution and dispossession, the saints determined not to let anyone, whether it be dissidents, Indians, non-Mormon emigrants, or even the U.S. Army, threaten their existence and drive them out again. But just as it had with the Danites in 1838, self-defense quickly morphed into more assertive and repressive violence, this time against a wider array of enemies. Latter-day Saint violence reached its climax or nadir in 1857, then tapered off quickly. Once the embers of the Mormon Reformation had cooled, the Utah War had been resolved peacefully with the army permanently ensconced outside Salt Lake City. Most Indians had been removed from areas of white settlement and the horror of the Mountain Meadows massacre became known to at least some in the church leadership, the appetite for using violence as a legitimate method of building the kingdom of God seems to have waned. But the horror still remained, as authors like Arthur Conan Doyle remembered. And so the legacy of Latter-day Saint violence in Pioneer Utah lives on, even though the church moved on long ago. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mason. That was uh, an amazing journey through a, a very uh, full topic. So we appreciate that. And I'd like to thank um, Rick Turley for introducing Dr. Mason. Uh, let's take questions and then I'll have a few announcements to close our meeting. Questions from the audience? I have a question. Go. Oh. Uh, my question is kind of a statement that, um, Patrick, do you think that church leadership at times enabled violence? And I'll point to a couple of cases. One, you mentioned the Lewis case with uh, Bishop Snow. And my understanding of that whole situation was that Lewis was interested in a young gal, and he was a single man, 
and he was courting her, but he had been warned to stay away from her by the bishop who already had several wives and had had eyes on her. And this resulted in violence. And when he didn't leave the girl alone, he was, uh, uh, he got in a fist fight. Uh, they condemned him to the prison, and then on the way, he was he was castrated as a warning that you don't mess with the bishop's girlfriends. Uh, the end of the story is that when his mother complained to Brigham Young, Brigham Young laughed about it. But in the end, he ended up marrying his mother in a way to provide for her, since she'd been deprived of his son and the future family. So that's an interesting story, but it seems like, uh, you know, the leadership condoned the violence and, and kind of looked the other way. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a fascinating and deeply troubling story. Um, uh, yeah, and, 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 and you've got the, the, the facts right there. And so, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely clear that in some cases, uh, uh, in, in, in this case, in the Parish Potter murders with Bishop Johnson, clearly um, in southern Utah around the Mountain Meadows massacre, the local church leaders were clearly uh, implicated uh, directly or indirectly in uh, condoning or directing or even participating in some of these violence. Now, of course, that's, that's not the case for most bishops and stake presidents uh, throughout the Mormon settlements. Uh, but in in these uh, in these particular cases that we can document, uh, it's it's clear that at least on occasion, uh, Mormon ecclesiastical leaders were either directly or indirectly involved. Other questions? What role did Jedediah M. Grant play in the uh, in any of this? Well, Jedediah Grant is a, is a hugely influential uh, preacher during the Mormon Reformation, uh, and his uh, he, he was he was one of the most uh, fervent and and eloquent uh, kind of hellfire and damnation uh, uh, preachers during that time. Of course, he dies early, so he doesn't have the the kind of long lasting effect um, that some of the other leaders who outlive him do. But but in this period. Uh, he's, uh, he, his rhetoric, he, he's among the most belligerent and bombastic in terms of his rhetoric. Now, I mean, one of the things that's, that's always hard to do is to connect rhetoric to action. Um, you know, and, and this is still an issue today, right? Do, do watching violent movies or playing violent video games uh, predispose somebody towards violence? And the, the research on this is very contested. It's very divided goes in lots of different directions. So, so would hearing a Jedediah M. Grant uh, with, with, with frankly the, the violence of, of much of his, uh, that was embedded in a lot of his preaching, would that predispose people uh, to use violence? Uh, you know, I, it, <clears throat> I, I would hesitate to, to draw a direct line uh, from, from a sermon to, uh, from any one sermon to, to, to a particular action, but cur certainly, there was a kind of uh, discursive culture of violence uh, that, uh, that, that provides a kind of backdrop for a lot of these actions. And, and I think part of the thought experiment is, what if, the, um, what if the, the sermons and the sermonic discourse of the 1850s was exactly the opposite? What if uh, the Latter-day Saint leaders adopted a kind of peace church rhetoric uh, in which they didn't use this kind of bellicose rhetoric in, in which they emphasized the kind of uh, the peaceful teachings of, of the New Testament and Jesus. Um, uh, would, would, we, would we have seen some of these same kinds of actions? It's, it's hard for me to believe that, uh, that, that the same actions would have ensued if the rhetoric was entirely different. Um, so it's, that this always bedevils us in terms of trying to connect discourse to action, but I do think discourse matters. Other questions? I, I had a question. I, I really was impressed with your idea of the Mormon community was already socially ordered. So the need for law and order on your own vigilantism seems unnecessary. And that's very fascinating. My question is, on the incidents you can document, 
were they also gone through a church court process? Was there a church law and justice process and then they were executed? Or are most of these extra legal even where the church court is concerned? Great question. Yeah, it's 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 the latter, unfortunately. And again, I think this is a, so it's a breakdown of what otherwise, as you as you mentioned, was actually a highly functioning um, kind of law and order system within Utah, both on the civil side and the ecclesiastical side. And of course, they they overlapped quite as uh, quite a bit, especially in these early years. Uh, and so, yeah, this the you know vigilantism when it was done properly uh and and this is always strange to us looking backward but it was it there were sort of informal rules for how this was supposed to happen and how it did play out even against the latter-day saints and, and of course they were just some of many victims of vigilante violence um it was supposed to be orderly it was supposed to be a gathering of the community it was supposed to have a certain level of transparency uh, oftentimes the leaders and elites of the community were involved uh, and so forth. And in a lot of these uh, episodes that I that I was talking about, um, we, we don't see any of those kinds of, of um, mechanisms. Now, of course, it doesn't make much difference to the to the person who's killed, right? Whether whether or not the proper forms of vigilantism were were followed. Um, but I but I do think as we look back and and we think about it, we do see that many of these instances that we can look at, um, they. Um, they, they show a breakdown in what was otherwise a, a fairly well-functioning church court system and, and church disciplinary system in addition to, to the civil side. Uh, Patrick, were you able to make any uh, statistical comparisons uh, with other uh, territories uh, with regard to Euro uh, anti-Euro American violence. That is not not the uh, violence against uh, Native Americans. Uh, it was about the same here as other places. But what about the uh, any kind of statistical comparison with other territories of uh, violence against Euro Americans? Great question, Tom. No, I ha I haven't done that. Um, I. It would be a that'd be a great master's thesis. I need to get one of my students on that. Uh, but um, I'd be fascinated to know what what we do know um, is, uh, and, and this is not original to me. Other research of, uh, other researchers have pointed this out is that Utah does seem exceptional in the sense that it doesn't spawn any large scale vigilante movements. Uh, uh, virtually every other state in the um, uh, in, in most of the country, Midwest, Far West, South, spawn these large scale vigilante movements that sometimes persist for years. Uh, Utah never has that. Uh, so it's exceptional in that regard. But I, I'd, I'd be just as interested in you are in, in looking at a statistical comparison, especially based on population and, and you know, controlling for some of those factors. Yeah. I'd like to see that. If you can get a master's student to do it, I'd uh, certainly be interested in seeing it. You've given me an idea. All right, I just need to find the right student. <laughs> Any other questions? Patrick, I'm just curious. Um, how many uh, bloody castrations and throats need to be cut before uh, the tone is set out to the community that, um, I mean, I'm just wondering if that did have a significant impact on folks living in the community, in, in the Utah Territory. I mean, these stories would have obviously got out pretty quickly. Yeah, that's a terrific question. And, and so you're exactly right. What, what you're suggesting is that the violence, especially in these kinds of, when it has this kind of disciplinary function, um, it's always intended to have a larger effect. Um, it's, it's meant to uh, to, to, to be a warning sign to others not to cross these same lines. Uh, and, and of course, that's exactly what Doyle is picking up on uh, when, when he suggests, now, now Doyle exaggerates and he goes well beyond the evidence and all those kinds of things, but, but he does pick up on that. Um, uh, w uh, w w there's, there's something to that in, in that these cases would serve, would have a chilling effect on, on people. Uh, it's a little bit hard to, to, to document that precisely. Um, and it is, um, it is true, as I mentioned at the end, that, that things change fairly dramatically after 
uh, the, the late 1850s. We don't see these same kinds of instances with, with the exception of continued violence against Native Americans. Um, now, is, is that because uh, church leaders of, uh, and, and church members about a change of heart? And they've decided, wait, wait a minute, that's, that's not what we want to do. That's not proper Christian behavior. Or is it because the violence did exactly what it was supposed to do? That it, that it, it sent the message, it sent the warning, it had that chilling effect. Um, and, uh, and, and then they didn't need to continue to do it. So it's, it's, a, it's, it, it's, it's a good question. I, I personally, uh, and, and again, this is, this is more supposition than evidence driven. I, I think it, it seems a combination of, of the two. I mean, some of the rhetoric that we do get from, from dissenters and others, uh, even several years after the 1850s, they continue to have a sense of kind of looking over their shoulder. Um, some of that may be exaggerated, some of that may be to, to effect, but they had precedent going all the way back to Missouri um, in 1838 and then what happened here in the 1850s. So they were not entirely wrong to have some concern, even, even if the, the general practice and, and behaviors had changed uh, by the 1860s. A quick question relative to the organizational structure. So could it, was it uncommon or common for a bishop in a, in a congregation to wield the power that would actually send a group of his, his constituent or his congregation out to commit acts of violence? Was it, a, a, could a, any bishop anywhere rouse that kind of uh, a support and behavior? I, I, it's a good question, and I think the answer is no. I mean, the, again, the fact that we, um, uh, that I, I don't know exactly how many Mormon bishops there were in 1850s Utah, certainly dozens, uh, maybe in the hundreds, I don't know how many wards there, there were exactly. The, the fact that we can point to this, uh, this handful of cases in which bishops uh, were involved, again, either directly or, or indirectly, uh, shows that this is a very small percentage uh, of, of, of people. Now, again, uh, the, the logic of violence, especially dis disciplinary violence, is you don't need everybody doing it all the time. Um, but, but neither, there's no evidence that this is some kind of coordinated um, kind of strategic effort. Uh, uh, this, the, the, there's no correlated uh, effort. This, uh, this is not a, a duty of the bishop or a right or a responsibility of the bishop. I, th I think quite the contrary, in fact. So, um, so no, this, these cases where bishops are involved would have been exceptional. They would have been, um, uh, and, and I have no doubt that many other bishops looked on and uh, with, uh, with some degree of, of disgust. Um, uh, and, and thinking that kind of behavior was inappropriate. So, so that the numbers of this are very, very small compared to the total number of bishops in the church. But, but if I understand correctly, the reprimand to the bishop was basically a wink and a smile. In, in these cases that I talked about, yeah, the Brigham Young does not take um, disciplinary action uh, against these, these people. And of course, the, the, the episode we know most about is Mountain Meadows and uh, sure. But uh, but it, but in these other cases as well, um, uh, yeah, the, the people aren't released from their callings. They're they're not uh, convicted. They're not tried either in civil or ecclesiastical courts, um, and so uh, they get away with it. Thank you. Yeah, but they were in the uh, Mountain Meadows massacre case. You're right. That's that's the exception. Right. Yeah. We, 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 and Mountain Meadows is exceptional in. And in, in, it, it, uh, some of these same patterns, or many of these same patterns hold true, but Mount Meadows is just, um, it's of, of a scale and seriousness uh, far beyond in any of this. So. One more question. Patrick? I have an observation. Can and a woman a ask a question tonight? <laughs> can you hear me? Go ahead. You're we'll do two, Barbara. Can you? Okay, okay can you? thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So I was the uh, the grand recipient of the door prize at a meeting that we had at the Alba Club, I believe, in the last few months. And the book that I got as my door prize was The Winter with the Mormons by David Bigler. And it's just a coincidence that I 
picked it up the other day and, and read it. I, I wasn't in anticipation of tonight's meeting because I didn't know the content of tonight's meeting. I probably got in an email from someone, but I didn't read it. So uh, this, this is interesting to hear what you have to say because this book is replete with the same type of uh, kind of shadowy activity and people being taken down and being the subject of quote hits by Brigham Young. I believe they use the actual term hit or a word very close to that in this book. And I was amazed at how much of this really went on and how much the church authorities knew about it, including Brigham Young. He probably knew almost all of it. At least this book would suggest that. So the question I would have, because you talked a little bit about it, and that is why was there such a negative view toward immigrants? They're on their way to, uh, cash in on the gold rush or to, to move their family and make a living in Oregon. Even when they were coming here to, to winter or they were coming through to get supplies or coming through Southern Utah for the same reason, it seemed like the immigrants were treated very poorly. And I don't understand the motivation for that. Well, but a lot of people on this call could answer that question even better than I could. Uh, what I'd say in brief is that I think it's a very mixed record that actually uh, a lot of the, the immigrant trains who were passing through were, were treated well, treated fairly, uh, supplied and provisioned uh, on their way to California uh, or to Oregon. Um, but but we there are these prominent examples where that was not the case. So, of course, the Baker Fancher party being the, uh, the, um, the, the the worst, but but there were others as well. I, I think. Um, uh, part of it depends on the particular time and particular circumstances of, of what was going on. So we always have to historicize and look at the, the particulars. I don't think we can just paint with a broad brush and say that there, there are patterns that hold true in, in all cases because it did change based on circumstances. But I think we have to keep in mind, I mean, at least what, what I really uh, believe to be true is, is that especially in this first decade of settlement, um, the, the Mormon settlement, uh, the, the Mormon place in the Great Basin was still somewhat pre precarious. And, and I do think um, <clears throat> that th this is where I do lean into some of this theory by, by social psychologists like Irvin Staub of the, the long lasting effects of the trauma that the, the Mormons brought with them into Utah. The, and these were very real traumas uh, from Missouri, from Illinois, that this was not made up. Uh, and, and so, they were looking after themselves first and foremost. And when they, uh, when outsiders came in and were perceived as threats, uh, then the needs of the community, uh, uh, you know, came, came first. Uh, now, I think in a lot of ways, this, this goes against their own best ideals. Uh, and in, in, in the, the, the hospitable reception they give to a lot of immigrants, that does meet their best ideals. But you know, 19th century Mormons were comp complex, morally complex, just like the rest of us are. Um, so my own sense is that the record is rather mixed, actually, in terms of the, uh, how they received these, these immigrants, and a lot of it depended on the particular circumstances. So Barbara, please close out our question session. Thank you for letting me have one more chance. Um, Patrick, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you have read um, the work of Laurel Thatcher Ulrich on Olive Combs recently. No, uh, I don't know that. So Olive Combs, uh, in Juanita Brooks's work, she uh, shares a family legend that Olive Combs was an investigative little school teacher living in Cedar City who was murdered in 1862 by George Wood for uh, supposedly investigating the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Um, Laurel has done some research on Olive Coombs and uh, has actually determined and shown that Olive Coombs was actually killed by Woods because her daughter was sexually involved with George Woods' son. And in fact, there's there's some indications that there may have Olive Coombs may have been running a brothel. And so that's one more um, example that you might want to include uh, in, in in your work that talks about using vigilante justice to control sexual behavior of others. So this uh, occurred in 1862. And she has a, uh, I think she has an article coming out, I think in the Utah Historical Quarterly very soon on this, but it's, it's one you want to include. 
And then um, Apostle George A. Smith, he leads an effort to get George Woods acquitted for, he's convicted for murder and he's acquitted and um, the governor um, acquits him, or what's the word, it pardons him. So he, right. he doesn't serve time for killing Olive and almost killing her daughter. So yeah, well, thanks for letting me know. And, and that, uh, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing that. Um, and of course, that goes along with what, um, you know, Ken Cannon's on the, the call here, and, and he has a great article on on what's called mountain common law, where which is practiced, uh, you know, uh, well into the uh late into the into the 19th century where uh it was it was common and it was commonly accepted throughout the united states uh to use this kind of violence against perceived sexual deviants right so in cases of adultery in cases of of rape fornication uh brothels uh other other kinds of things uh you know even even you know cheating wives uh uh, uh or cheating husbands uh, and so, um, so these, uh, so that, yeah, and, and, and in that, uh, in that instance, Mormons are, are don't seem to me uh, to, to be at all exceptional. They, they seem to be very much in line with, with broader national trends. Dr. Mason, thank you for a thoughtful and well-researched uh, presentation this evening and well-presented.